Welcome to our installment of the orthopedic module based on the spine. For this period of time, we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit about spine anatomy. Just a little refresher there. We're also going to talk about our fractures. We're going to try to divide those into stable and unstable because we think that's important. Uh, we're going to talk a little about the levels of the spine um, and uh, just a slide or so on the partial cord lesions. Cervical spine has seven vertebrae. Uh, of course, we have a couple of special vertebrae at the very top, uh, the atlas, or C1, where the skull sits, and then C2, or axis, which provides for the uh, shaking of the head no. Um, we do have um, then the others, and then uh, the special thing about the cervical vertebrae is that the vertebral artery runs right through a couple holes in the vertebrae, which make it especially dangerous at times. Uh, thoracic, there are 12 of those typically, and lumbar 5, although we do know that some people will have 6, a uh, small percentage. Uh, and then finally the sacrum, which is a, a group of fused vertebrae at the bottom. So, um, some landmarks that we need to know. The diaphragm is controlled by C3, 4, and 5. So we typically say C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. That's an easy way to say it. Uh, nipples are at T4. I don't have a handy little mnemonic for that, nor do I have one for the umbilicus, which is T10. Um, and then the cord changes to cauda equina, and this isn't the syndrome, this is the actual anatomy of it. So the cord kind of changes into that uh, series of uh, nerve bundles. Uh, at the bottom looks like a horse's tail at about L1 or so. Good landmark to know for uh, lumbar punctures. Don't really want to go any higher than that. So, um, cauda equina is a special syndrome that we like to talk about a lot in the emergency department. I, I would challenge you that you probably won't go through a shift without having it come up on your differential just because back pain is so prominent. Um, you know, saddle paresthesia is a hallmark of this, as well as uh, symptoms of the bladder and bowels. Bladder and bowels are a little bit confusing for some. Um, you know, the, the issue with the bladder is that uh, you actually have retention. Um, and it's overflow incontinence then. So it's actually first retention and then uh, then they start wetting themselves. Uh, as for the bowels, they just uh, can't stop those whatsoever. So that's bowel incontinence. Uh, so my question typically for patients is, um, are you able to go to the bathroom okay? Are you able to go when you want to and stop when you want to? And then I ask that for both uh, number one and number two. As for anterior cord syndrome, which we do see a fair amount um, with some of our fracture issues, that's a good one to review. Um, you have motor and sensory loss because those are the uh, anterior segments there. Um, uh, but you get sparing of the dorsal column, which is deep pressure and proprioception. So it's an odd little pairing there. Uh, moving on. So we're going to talk about fractures. That's where we're going to spend the majority of our time here. That's where we see a lot of board questions come from. We do see a lot of these patients as well. Um, so you know it's better than just for tests. So cervical spine, we usually use a two-column concept. Uh, we make that division, you know, anterior, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament, the vertebral body and disc, and the posterior longitudinal ligament we consider in the anterior column. And then the posterior is kind of everything behind that, obviously, the facet joints, the articular processes, and the ligamental plavum. So we know that it's definitely unstable if we disrupt both. Uh, it could possibly be unstable if you disrupt even just one, uh, but that depends. Uh, and then, of course, there are, there are injuries that are stable uh, that may still cause a problem. Uh, so here we go. We're divided them into stable and unstable, and we're going to put this slide at the end of the uh, cervical fracture section as well, so you can see it a second time. Uh, stable fractures are type 1 odontoid, a clay shovelers, which is really just a spinous process fracture, a transverse process fracture, a C1 posterior arch fracture, anterior wedge, and burst fractures. Those last three have asterisks because they may be stable fractures, but each of those does have a high association with um, spinal cord issues. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's stable, if the fracture fragment is slammed up against the spinal cord, you're still going to have problems. The unstable ones, the Jefferson fracture, Hangman's fracture, type 2 and 3 odontoid, flexion teardrop, and extension teardrop. Um, you know, we know that in orthopedics um, and in lots of phases of medicine, we really love our eponyms. Um, so you want to try to get familiar with a few of these at least um, so that you can sound like you know what you're doing and know what you're looking at. 
So a Jefferson fracture is a burst fracture of C1. It is highly unstable. Uh, it's caused by a vertical compressive force. And there's a fracture of the anterior and posterior arches. The pre-dental space is uh, greater than three millimeters in adults or five millimeters in children. And that would be abnormal. So we're going to blow through a lot of these, um, see so we'll move kind of quickly. Uh, you know, you can jump back and review them as needed, um, but I don't want to necessarily read the whole slide to you, but we'll, we'll see what we can do here. So uh, a C1 posterior arch fracture, you know, typically with forced neck extension, and you get some compression there between the two pieces of bone. And as we talked about earlier, it may be stable, but it still can be very dangerous. Hangman's fracture, uh, spondylolysis uh, and bilateral pedicle fracture of C2. And it's a sudden decel with extreme hyperextension of the neck. And uh, this is a very unstable fracture. Um, core damage is often minimal and a large canal diameter at C2 to thank for that, as well as the fact that bilateral fractures actually allow for some decompression. The odontoid or dens, um, and we have a few types of those. So we typically like to classify those as type 1, 2, and 3. You can see the diagram there on the right depicting that. Uh, type 1 going just through the top part there, type 2 going through the base, and then type 3 even extending down into the body there. So um, a forceful flexion or extension of the head. Uh, open mouth AP view is especially helpful for this, but obviously we're typically going to be getting a CT scan. Um, type 2 and 3 are unstable, and uh, type 2 has a 50% non-union rate, so that's a pretty poor prognosis. So uh, we have anterior wedge fractures, and uh, these are forceful flexion causing compression. Uh, it can be unstable if it's greater than 50% uh, decrease in height there. Also unstable if there's multiple adjacent fractures, in it, but it is rarely associated with cord injury. As you can see, the, the major um, uh, injury here occurs uh, kind of far away from the spinal cord there on the very anterior part of the uh, body. Flexion teardrop fractures are a forceful flexion causing compression and the vertebral body collides with the body below and it causes that anterior displacement of a wedge fragment. Uh, typically lower down the cervical spine as you get a more of a whip action there and it's highly unstable it's associated with the anterior cervical cord syndrome. You can see that uh, that upper uh, vertebral body there sliding forward on the lower one. You can just imagine that cord getting pinched in there. Extension teardrop, a little different uh, mechanism here. That's a forceful extension, and it's an avulsion of the anterior inferior corner, corner uh, by anterior longitudinal ligament. Uh, these are common with diving accidents. Um, unstable, typically uh, C2, uh, but also C5, 6, and 7. Uh, central cord syndrome is common with this, with that forceful extension. Remember, it's central cord syndrome, you get the majority of your symptoms in the arms um, and much less in the legs. It has a similar appearance uh, to a flexion teardrop, um, but extension does not typically use lose vertebral body height, so that's a good thing to try to differentiate it with. Ah, so spinous posturous fractures, um, clay shovelers is another name for that. Um, it's a forced neck flexion. Um, MVC or direct trauma can cause this. It is uh, considered a stable fracture and is more common in the lower cervical vertebrae. Again, just with a longer lever, you're able to create more force to cause this avulsion here. With burst fractures, they have an axial compressive force. Uh, the nucleus pulposus of the disc is forced up into the vertebral body and uh, creates a combinated fracture uh, with a vertical fracture on the AP films. Um, it is stable, um, but um, there are fracture fragments, which are, are an issue. You know, it can typically cause anterior cord syndrome. There are some unstable equivalents for this. Um, so um, a bad enough fracture that causes neuro symptoms, greater than 50% height loss, greater than 20% spinal angulation, or a loss of greater than 50% of the canal would be considered um, unstable equivalent just because it's uh, such a poor prognosis. Um, so I guess the important thing here to remember is, uh, you know, if it's uh, really smushed, uh, really out of line, 
um, or if the canal appears to be quite pinched, or if you know they can't feel their legs, then that's a problem. So, a cervical transverse process fracture. Um, the major thing we want to remember here is that the vertebral arter artery runs right through that, and that when you see a fracture involving the uh, um, transverse process or into the vertebral foramen, that we need to get a CT angiogram to evaluate better for that. And make sure there's no artery dissection or injury. So again, here's our list of uh, stable fractures. We have the type 1 odontoid on the left, while the 2 and 3 are on the right with the unstables. We've got clay shovelers, because that's just a spinous process. We've got transverse process, although we know we need to worry about the vertebral artery there. We've got C1, posterior arch, anterior wedge, and burst, which can be stable or can be considered uh, quite dangerous, though, depending. Uh, and then finally on the other side we have our Jefferson and the Hangman's fractures, which we know are significant fractures. And then flexion teardrop and extension teardrop, uh, differentiating those by the extension not having any vertebral body height loss. Moving on, so thoracolumbar three column concept. So it's a little different when you get lower down. So the um, anterior column will make up with the anterior longitudinal ligament and the anterior half of the vertebral body, uh, disc and annulus. The uh, middle column being the posterior half, the vertebral body, disc, and annulus, and the posterior longitudinal ligament. And then finally, the posterior column being the facet joints and articular processes, uh, ligamentum flavum, uh, vertebral arch, and interconnecting ligaments. So we need to disrupt two out of these for an unstable fracture. So here's our list for this one. It's a little shorter, so we'll go through this a little faster. Um, you know, for stable fractures, we have our transverse process fractures, spinous process fractures, uh, facet laminar, pars, and then finally compression fracture. And for this one, compression gets the asterisk uh, because as we'll talk about, there are some compression fractures that we do consider unstable or at least very dangerous. Uh, burst fractures on the unstable side and a chance fracture, which is a flexion distraction injury that we'll talk about. Uh, it's an important one historically um, that's been uh, greatly reduced with the advent of the shoulder belt in cars. So, uh, compression fractures, uh, 50 to 70 percent of thoracic and lumbar fractures are compression fractures. This is the major one that we will see. Uh, there's an axial load, uh, especially while in flexion. The compressive failure of the anterior column results, um, and it is considered unstable if there's greater than 50 percent loss of height or if there's greater than the 30 degrees fracture kyphosis. And the x-ray may not show a posterior column disruption, which would then be a burst fracture. So um, you know, our, our x-rays can routinely miss the issues with the posterior column. So that's where you know, if you think you see a fracture, a CT scan is needed. Burst fractures are 14% of thoracic and lumbar fractures. Uh, as you can see there in the top picture, that, that can be especially devastating. Uh, again, a compressive force. Uh, falls and motor vehicle crashes are common for this now. Um, these are considered unstable. There are neuro deficits in about 50% of these, and it may be confused for anterior wedge fractures on radiographs, as we talked about in the last slide. Flexion distraction, again, this is a chance fracture. It was most common with a lap belt only, and um, you know, obviously a sudden deceleration causing extreme flexion and compressive failure. Um, it has increased length of vertebral segment, and you really need your sagittal reconstructions to get a great handle on this many times. Um, they're pure ligamentous disruption in 10 to 25 percent. This is a very unstable fracture, and it can be often misdiagnosed as a compression fracture. So we have the so-called minor fractures. Of course, they're minor to anyone except for the patient. Um, they still hurt a lot, and uh, people don't like them because of that. Fourteen percent of thoracic and lumbar fractures or injuries are considered in this category. Uh, we have our isolated transverse process fractures, our spinous process fractures, facet and laminar fractures. So uh, hitting our last couple slides here, you know, thoracolumbar stability here, so we'll just recap again. So stable fractures being transverse process, spinous process, facet, laminar, pars, and then the compression there was the asterisk, uh, as we know that uh, greater than 50% height loss or greater than 30 degrees of fracture kyphosis uh, will be considered unstable. Um, also, burst fractures, 
and chance fractures are unstable chance being a flexion distraction injury and again historically important because we've greatly reduced that uh, since we got people to wear better seat belts. So we need to know our levels of spinal involvement. Um, if that means you need to look it up during a shift, go and look it up. Uh, that will be uh, will serve you well, it will serve your patient well. More than just making you look smart, it will make you kind of know what you're looking for to begin with, uh, know what to be expected. Um, you know, if you know on your exam that somebody has an anterior cord syndrome, um, you're going to know exactly what to look for. You, you might even be able to pinpoint the level that it's at, uh, which will uh, make it much easier for you when you're going to look at that radiograph or you call the radiologist to tell them that they missed something because you knew exactly where to look because you had the benefit of actually seeing the patient. Um, you know, the spinal syndromes are important. Uh, we only talked about a couple of those here. Uh, you want to go and look those up. Those are uh, on every board exam that you will ever take. They've probably already been on a couple that you've taken. Uh, so we know central cord, anterior cord, uh, Brown's cord, uh, cauda equina, um, and I'm sure I'm missing some. So uh, stable versus unstable. Remember for cervical we have a two column system and thoracolumbar lumbar a three collar system, column system. So when you're looking at those films, um, you can at least uh, be looking for whether it's been disrupted or whether those uh, columns have been disrupted. Knowing that in cervical, if the, both columns are disrupted, that's obviously unstable. Um, and then for thoracolumbar, lumbar, if two of the three are disrupted, that's an unstable fracture. Uh, even stable fractures can be a surgical emergency. That's an important thing to remember that when you look at the films or the uh, CT scan, even if it doesn't look that bad, if the patient's having neurologic symptoms, uh, they need urgent uh, orthopedic or neurosurgical consultation for spine. Very good, excellent. Well, uh, have a good day, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed our little run through the spinal cord here.